Hello, thanks for participating in this presentation. Uh, my name is Burhan Ogut. I'm a principal researcher at the American Institutes for Research. Um, this session is quite unique in the sense that all presenters are presenting research from a newly uh, funded uh, IES program called Research, research Grants Focused on Need Process Data for Learners with Disabilities. I'm leading a project with Ruhan Chirji, whom you will hear from soon. Uh, that aims to systematically explore 2017 NAEP grade 8 mathematics uh, process data to provide empirical evidence on the utilization of accessibility features, uh, including uh, accommodations that are provided to students who have IEP or 504 plans and uh, universal design elements that are available for all students. Uh, and we, all, we also explore how items characteristics, student characteristics, and school characteristics are related to the utilization of accessibility features, and whether utilization, a, a utilization of accessibility features relates to students' uh, test-taking behavior and, and performance. Um, for this project, we create new and multidimensional measures of uh, accessibility feature use and employ traditional analysis along with emerging techniques at machine learning to explore uh, accessibility use patterns and also, we also employ uh, uh, quasi-experimental methods to examine the relationship between accessibility use and student test-taking behavior and performance. Um, our research team has four researchers from AAR, including myself, Juanita Hick, uh, Rohan Chirji, and Dergi. And we have also Dr. Michelle Yin from Northwestern University. So uh, for, for today's talk, I'm gonna be talking about uh, our initial exploration in, in the in uh, accessibility versus uh, availability of ex uh, uh, availability versus use of accessibility features uh, and how they relate to student performance. Um, just the acknowledgments here of uh, this, uh, uh, this research is uh, funded by IES, but all the opinions and if there are any errors are ours. And uh, digital-based assessments are gaining popularity across districts, states, uh, and the nation. Using um, universal design, design framework, these um, uh, assessments aims to improve accessibility by offering accessibility features that are aimed to level the field for all students and especially for students with disabilities. However, empirical evidence on the effectiveness of accessibility features is outdated and mostly comes from uh, non-digital non test administrations which makes it a limited use for providing guidance on how to modernize our assessments in a digital world. So um, in, in addition to uh, these high-stake assessments uh, employing these uh, DBAs or digital-based assessments, low-stake assessments like NAEP also has adopted uh, DBAs. Uh, for those of us who don't know too much about NAEP, uh, NAEP is a congressionally mandated assessment of what US students know and can do in various subjects and grades. Uh, NAEP has been gradually introducing computers and digital technologies into assessment over the last few decades. And operational transition into uh, digital assessment in reading and math into 2017. Uh, this uh, ENAPE, which is called ENAPE, uh, offers three uh, accessibility features. Uh, two of them are accommodations. Again, accommodations are only for the students who have IEP or 504 plans. And well, one set of accommodations are provided by the test delivery system, like the extended time. The other accommodations uh, are provided outside the test delivery system, like uh, taking breaks during the test. Uh, universal design elements are special in the sense that they are available to all students like uh, highlights, uh, text-to-speech, and, and so forth. In addition to collecting um, uh, data on stu uh, student assessments, uh, ENAP also uh, collects uh, data on students' interactions with the assessment system. And this log file, which is also sometimes called uh, process data, consists of timestamped records of students' actions or activities, like uh, using a, one of these universal design elements, like highlighter, for example, and like some automatic generated actions, like switching between items. Um, currently, NAEP has six general sessions. The blue, the blue boxes that you see in this figure are what we are interested in mostly for process data. And uh, those include two cognitive block items and a tutorial. These NAEP assessments start with a tutorial where students are provided some, uh, uh, provided a chance to work or uh, play around with the uh, accommodations or accessibility features available to them. And 
the cognitive blocks are where students, there are two cognitive blocks consisting of 30 minutes uh, each and um, where the assessment takes place. In the case of extended time, the students given additional 30 minutes to complete the task. Um, also, uh, they are at the end of this assessment, they are giving this questionnaire where the information on their backgrounds and social, social, socioeconomic uh, variables are collected. And uh, process data includes all students' interactions from throughout this assessment. So we will be able to capture how they interact with the, uh, with the um, different parts, different components of NAEP assessments. Um, here, we are going to look at a very brief example of what we mean or how, how data collect, how uh, process data is collected in name. Here, there's an example here of an assessment where a student uh, sees a math item where he needs to, he needs, he needs to complete some, uh, some calculations to answer this question. And at the top of the screen, the students will, will see these uh, universal design elements or accommodations that are available to them. In this case, for example, this is a math question. So the student decides to use the calculator. And he, uh, the student opens the calculator. He uh, punches in some, num some numbers to find the correct answer, closes the calculator, and types in the correct answer and goes to the next question. So the interactions that are logged on the background includes they're entering this item, the student opening the calculator, student typing the punching in some numbers in the calculator, student closing the calculator, and getting the correct answer, uh, clicking next. So use this data is logged, and we use this log data to create this process data table, which includes uh, information on students, student ID, the, where the items come from, item ID, and the events that the students has completed while he's, he was interacting or she was interacting with this item. And we use this process data table to do our analyses. Next slide. So the current uh, research uh, is really limited on whether or how students, uh, special students with disabilities use accessibility features in digital-based assessments. With process data, we can now actually study, explore how students use accessibility features. And this study explores how accessibility features are used and the relation between accessibility feature use and student performance by leveraging process data collected as part of the 2017 grade eight mathematics assessment. Um, again, data comes from the, the data that we use for this, uh, for this study is the achievement and process data from a release block of items from the 2017 NAEP assessment, grade eight mathematics assessments. There are about 28,000 students in this, in this data and students in NAEP assessments are randomly assigned to blocks and uh, we create measures of use for two accommodations, extended time and calculator, and three universal design elements, text-to-speech, scratch work, and equation editor. Uh, now we're gonna briefly look at uh, some descriptive statistics on the availability versus use. Uh, this table lists uh, accom three accommodations and three, uh, two accommodations and three universal design elements. A uh, second column shows the number of uh, percent of students who are granted or assigned these uh, in the case of accommodations, accommodations. And if we, when we look at the table, we see that uh, about 7.5% of the students are granted extended time. Uh, last two uh, last two columns shows the amount of uh, the percent of students who use accessibility features. And extended time is used by about 38% of the students, meaning that majority of the students who were granted this extended time as an accommodation, in fact, did not use it. And uh, calculator is uh, was available uh, to two, about 0.2% of the students in the sample. And in our sample, nobody used the calculator as an accommodation. Um, universal design elements, uh, when we look at the numbers here, we see that accommodated students, again, accommodated students are those who, who have uh, IAP or 504 plans. Uh, about uh, the accommodated students used text-to-speech and scratch work more than the non-accommodated students, but they, 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 both the students are equally used as equation editor. About 43% of the students use equation editor as a universal design element. Now we're going to start looking at how, uh, access, uh, how these accessibility features relate to student performance. And we're going to start with the first accommodation, extended time. Here, this is what we would get if we don't have access to the process data. What we are seeing in this table is the average number of correct items by students who are granted extended time and students who are not granted extended time. And as you can see from this graph, the dark bar shows that students who were not granted extended time scored on average 3.4 more points on this test. 
Now, if you, what happens if you bring in the uh, process data? This is what we see in the next slide. When we bring in the process data, we see that the, if you focus on this um, um, uh, middle bar, light blue and the, and the gold bar, we see that students who are granted extended time and actually use this extended time, on average scored one more items correctly than the students who were granted but they choose not to use this extended time. In the next slide, we're gonna further break this down with these bars by the disability status of the students. Now, let's focus on first comparison here. The first one, this shows the comparison between students with disabilities who used extended time versus who did not use extended time. So the blue bar shows who did not use extended time and the gold bar shows who use extended time. And on average, students who use extended, students with disabilities who, were, who use extended time scored 1.2 points higher than those who did not use. And uh, the second comparison, last two, uh, last two columns shows the same similar patterns for those students without disabilities. We see again that those students without disabilities who use extended time scored on average 0.7 more points than uh, the students who did not use on this assessment. And I also want to point out that, you know, those dark blue bar at the, at the very front, at the first dark blue bar, that's the average score for students with disabilities who are not granted extended time. As you can see there, they are scoring lower than those students who are granted extended time and actually use it, the, the, the uh, uh, goal bar. Now, um, we are going to um, look at the equation editor. Yeah, we are going to look at equation editor. This is a universal design element. And remember, the universal design element is available to all students, unlike extended time. So here, what we see is that those students who used equ equation editor on average scored one more, one more points than the students who did not use equation editor. And again, breaking this down by the uh, disability status of the student, we see that first, students with disabilities who use equation editor on average scored 0.4 more points than students who did not use equation editor. So with disabilities who did not use equation editor. And we see again, similar pattern here that uh, student without disabilities who use equation editor Sco uh, scored on average one more points than the uh, students who did not use equation editor. And uh, remember, in the extended time, the difference uh, there was the different. There was more uh, additional boost for students with disabilities. In this case, equation editor, we see an additional boost for student without disabilities who who use the equation editor. And uh, next. Uh, we're gonna look at another uh, universal design element, uh, which is called text-to-speech. And here, we, can, we, we see a different case than uh, we, see, we looked at two examples we just looked at. Here, what we find is that students who use the te text-to-speech, in fact, scored lower than students who did not use text-to-speech. On average, 1.8 items less than those students who did not use this text-to-speech. Um, trying to figure out why this is the case, or we observe similar results for student disabilities. We again break down these numbers by student disabilities. And in fact, we see the same pattern here that students with disabilities who used text to speech scored lower than student with, without a student without disabilities who did not use text to speech. And same for the student without disabilities, those who use text to speech scored lower than those who did not use, use text to speech. And again, here, it appears that the, uh, the uh, student without disabilities did a little worse, in fact, uh, on, on the, when using text-to-speech compared to students without, with disabilities. Um, let's try to recap what we find here. Uh, in terms of accommodations, what we find was that uh, you know, more than half of the students who were granted extended time did not actually use it. And in our case, uh, in this, especially in this block of, that, of data that we have, none of the students who were accommodated, who were granted calculator as an accommodation did not use it. And in terms of performance, what we find was that uh, all students, in fact, and, and especially students with, that, with disabilities, who use extended time scored higher than those who did not use it. And uh, there's a less clear picture for uh, universal design elements. Um, in terms of use, 
we find that accommodated students use text to speech and scratch work more than the non accommodated students. And almost half of the students, both students with and without disabilities, use equation editor. And, uh, but when you look at the performance, though, what we find was that only, under, only when using equation editor, it seems like students uh, are, uh, have their perform they have a little better performance than when they do not use it. And it was the opposite for, for text-to-speech, where we find that using text-to-speech, in fact, was associated with some, some sort of lowered performance. And um, as, as again, uh, this is an ongoing, pro ongoing process, ongoing study. And then uh, we have some future work, uh, including conducting, conducting propensity score matching models to minimize selection bias when we are looking at the relationship between uh, accessibility feature use and student performance and text -take, test taking behavior. And uh, we want to also differentiate between degrees of use. Now, in, all the, in this presentation, all the uh, use variables are created in a binary, binary sense, right? what indicate, like whether or not they used any accessibility feature. But we also want to be able to differentiate between degrees of accessibility feature use. And uh, finally, we also want to find out and examine conditions under which accessibility features might may benefit or may inhibit students' performance. And uh, that's all from me for now. And uh, thanks for listening. And I'll, I'll be waiting for the discussion section. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I am Ruhan Chirji. I'm a senior researcher at American Institutes for Research. For those that uh, they are just listening, I am a she, her. I am Turkish. I have black hair and brown eyes. I'm wearing a black sweater and large pink headphones. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about how we can use graph theory approaches to examine potentially complex relationships between accessibility features. Moving forward, I will be sharing our preliminary exploration results using black level data from NAEP 2017 grade eight mathematics assessment. This work has been supported by Institute of Education Sciences to the grant to American Institutes for Research. NAEP offer a range of accessibility features that consist of accommodations that are available only to students with disabilities and English language learners, as well as universal design elements that are available to all students. The availability of accessibility features is critical to leveraging the power of technology and providing equal opportunity for all students, particularly those with disabilities. As we already heard, availability of process data make it possible to examine students' actual use of accessibility features in addition to assignment of those features prior to the assessment administration. In this presentation, we, uh, we are specifically interested in examining the connections between those accessibility features. We will specifically address three research questions. We will examine accommodations that are commonly granted to students and if there's any differences across disability groups, as well as commonly used accessibility feature combinations. When we examine relationships, we need to deal with complex objects. So we need to use different approaches. One approach that we can use is frequent mining. Simply, we can examine accessibility features that appear together. We can explore sets of co-occurring accessibility features. They can be set of a single, couple, triple, or more features. Also, we can create networks to represent the relationships between those features and explore network properties such as how dense or connected the network. Each approach addresses different research questions regarding students' use of accommodations and universal design element. Our work covers both approaches. With this line of the work, we have three contributions to the field, hopefully. First, we examine accessibility features, both accommodations and universal design elements in an interconnected way using partial co-occurrences and networks. Second, we identify major co-occurrences among accessibility features for different disability groups. 
then we explore the relationship between students' academic achievement levels and accessibility feature assignment and use measures. We will not focus on the last point for this presentation. For the rest of this talk, we will focus on the descriptive results and visuals of accessibility feature interconnectedness. We will get a glimpse of results from network analysis and clustering results as well. In this analysis, we use data from one block of a NAEP 2017 grade eight mathematics assessment. Overall, 35 different accommodations are available for NAEP assessments. In the current black level data, we have results for 15 of them. Also, there are more than 30 disability categories in NAEP. Due to the sample size and scope of this presentation, we will focus on five disability groups. These are autism, emotional, intellectual, specific learning, and speech disability groups. In our data set, only 6% of students are assigned to more than one disability categories and have been excluded from further analysis. It is possible that students are granted for more than one accommodations as well. However, in this, our, in this data set, most of the students allowed access to only one accommodation, but we also utilize multiple assignments. It is also important to note that 27% of the students with individualized education plan did not receive any recommend accommodations. Moving forward, our analysis include almost 1,500 students with disabilities. We use unweighted data for the following analysis. To explore the co-occurrences of accessibility features, we use frequent mining approach. To identify sets of co-occurrences, we will focus on two measures. First is the support measure, which is an indication of how frequent the set of accessibility features in the data set. That is to say, frequency of use across all students. Second measure is confidence. Confidence measure, which is, is an indication of how often students use a set of features, also use another feature. Simply to say, it's a conditional probability measure. First column in the table shows five disability groups that we are focusing on. Second column shows common occurring sets of accommodations granted to the students. So this is availability of accommodations. We observe that across all disability groups, extended time is the most common accommodations made available to the students. Next, the pairs of extended time and breaks during the test and extended time and separate sessions are the most common combinations of accommodations. Last column on the slide represent common co-occurrences of use of accessibility features. Accessibility features means accommodations plus universal design elements together. Results for use of accessibility features show that zoom feature, which is a universal design element, is most common across all disability groups. Text-to-speech, drawing tool, and equation editor is also commonly used universal design element. To highlight the differences, we see that extended time is not as commonly used which is contrary to its common availability. So in the previous slide, we have focused on co-occurrences of the accessibility features. Now we will examine the relationship between them via networks. In a network, circles, also the no known as nodes, represent the accessibility features, and links, also known as edges, represent the number of Let's start with the availability of accommodations again. On the slide, both graphics represent the same information. As we already expect, based on our previous slide results, extended time is central to the accommodation assignments. Extended time frequently paired with breaks during session, separate session, bilingual dictionary, preferential seating, and queuing accommodation. Next. Let's continue with the accommodation plus universal, uh, universal design element features and their network structure. 
For the use of accessibility features, it is important to note that using process data, we can extract user information only for some of the accommodations, such as extended time and calculator. For those accommodations that we cannot track their use with the data, such as breaks during session, we assume they have been used. Again, on the slide, both graphs represent the same information. We observe that there is a dense and complex network structure of accessibility features. That is to say, there are too many links between these features. The network on the right side of the slide shows that some features are heavily used and well-connected, such as text-to-speech in equation editor or zoom and draw features. This graph signals that we may have separate clusters of features. Next, let's, let's explore if we can identify groups of accessibility features. In networks, highly connected clusters are usually referred to as communities instead of clustered. Community detection is an unsupervised process. Using the Wine algorithm, we try to partition a graph into subsets of nodes by trying to maximize the modularity. Modularity may be a new term for you. It is a measure of structure of networks. It measures the strength of division of a network into clusters. In our accessibility use graph, we identify three communities. The first one is represented by blue nodes and includes only accommodations of separate session, queuing, preferential seating, and specific other. The second group represented by red nodes and includes a mix of accommodations and universal design elements, including extended time, breaks during test, and eliminate choice. The last group is represented by red nodes, uh, sorry, green nodes, you know, and it's also represented by only universal design elements, including team change, text-to-speech, and use of equation editor. Next, let's examine if the use of accessibility features differ across disability groups. To examine the use differences across disability groups, we use a heat map and a dendrogram, which is a tree structure graph in the heat map to visualize the results of a hierarchical clustering calculation. In the heat map, each cell reports a standardized value accompanied by a color with higher use associated with darker colorings. On the x-axis, we see accessibility features, both accommodations and universal design elements, and related dendrogram on the reflection axis, it means at the top of the graph. On the y-axis, we see disability groups and dendrogram on the reflection axis as well. The results show, uh, show um, interesting findings. First, first one is that students with learning disability use all accessibility features heavily in comparison to other groups as reflected by red color across all features. Second, students in emotional, Autism and speech disability groups have similar use of universal design features and extended time use. Third, students in intellectual disability group differ in their use of universal design features, except text-to-speech use. So uh, what, we, what we see already that different student disability groups may tend to have different patterns of use of accessibility features. In the next step of this work, we will be focusing on extracting the co-occurrences of accessibility support features in relation to students' performance, as well as examining the usefulness of network measures in predicting students' achievement level. And also we will explore differences in nodes and edges across networks between achievement levels uh, and students with disability groups. Thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Hello, my name is Suzu Zhang, and my presentation is on examining the differences in item visit patterns across disability groups. I'm an assistant professor of quantitative psychology and statistics at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. My research pertains to quantitative methods for solving practical problems in testing. 
In particular, I am interested in the use of problem solving process data to inform measurement and learning. The presentation I'll give today is about the NAEP math assessment. The NAEP math assessment data has shown that learners with disabilities continuously exhibit much poorer math performance compared to their peers without disabilities. Our study is going to use the restricted use process data from the NAEP 2017 math assessment to understand the differences in review and revision patterns across disability groups. For the NAEP 2017 mathematics assessment data, let me first provide a introduction to it. NAEP is the largest nationally administered low stakes test that represents student achievement in the United States. In 2017, the grade eight mathematics assessment included two 30 item block questions in each digital test form. The computer-based test allowed the collection of process data, which is the ordered sequence of observed events that an examinee executes in pursuit of solving a problem. This can include keystrokes, clicks, and use of different tools on the question. But here, we will restrict our decision to the revision and review process of examinees on the item. Here's an example of a question, which is question eight in the NAEP um, grade eight mathematics test. We can see that this is a typical multiple choice question, but since it is presented in a computer-based platform, it allows the reporting of the sequence of actions and individual performance on the question. For example, if a person clicks a response and changes it to a different response, then we can record the log of their answer changes. If they get clear, um, click clear answer, it's going to remove their answer choice and um, reset to the original position. They can also click back and forth to leave the question and move to an earlier or a later question, or they can click the different panes on the top to move between items. So here's an example of revision and review process for an examinee on such an item. So for each of the actions they perform, there's an associated timestamp. For this examinee, they entered the question, chose the correct response, and then decided to click and clear their answer and then choose a wrong response instead. Then they exited the item. Later on, after some time, they returned back to the question indicated by enter item and then another and an exit item. So on the second visit, this individual didn't do anything. So here's the revision review process. And based on the final response of this examinee to the question, we can calculate a final score. Since the final response is choose wrong, this person's final score on the question is zero. And we can also calculate the total response time on the question. We can see that the action sequence can contain information that is not available in a final score. And this can reveal some meaningful patterns for us. One such example is hesitation. For example, those examinees who are unsure about the correct response may be more likely to exhibit answer change. Those who are sure might just submit an answer and move on to the next question without alternating between different choices. It can also review people's different test navigation styles. For example, does the student respond to the question on their first visit? Or does the student go back to an earlier question to perform review? For this study, we're going to look at two research questions of our interest. RQ1, which is our first research question, is are there different types of review and revision behavior on the same item? The second question is about group differences. Do learners with learning disability, autism spectrum disorder, and their typically developing peers differ in their revision and review behavior? So how do we answer these questions? Before introducing the methods, let's attend to the structure of the process data. We can see that the revision process structure differs from that from the ordinary data that we use to analyze in a lot of statistical analysis. For each of the individual's process data, it's a variable categorical ordered sequence of events. It's variable length, meaning that different examinees on the exact same item can differ in their sequence length. For example, examinee one here has six total actions because they did some alternation between different choices. For examinee two, however, he or she only has three actions, enter item, choose right, and exit item. You can also notice that each of these actions in the sequence is sampled from a set of all possible actions 
And the set can sometimes be large for simple questions and can for, be small for simple questions. And it can be a large set for some more complex questions. And also the temporal ordering of the actions is substantively meaningful. To give a toy example, let's consider the consecutive enter item followed by exit item. If this enter followed by exit is at the very beginning of a person's action sequence, as over here, it might indicate preview behavior. This is the case where the student is just taking an initial look at the question without submitting the answer. Later on, they return to the question to give a response. The same enter followed by exit if it's at the end of the action sequence, may represent review behavior. This is the case where the student is done with the test and is coming back to this question to check their answer and make sure it is correct. So we want a method that can capture the differences in these aspects in the log data. To answer RQ1, which is identifying the types of review and revision behavior, we will apply hierarchical agglomerated clustering to the revision log data. In other words, the sequence of revision and review related actions. These action sequences can contain actions related to clicking choices, either on the entire item, clicking different kinds of choices that are correct or incorrect, or clicking choices in each of the parts, because some of the questions have multiple parts and the student needs to go click choices in each part. It can also contain clear answer, which indicates removing previous answers, and it contains enter and exit, which indicates entering and leaving a question. We also remove visits, so enter followed by exits, that are shorter than three seconds in length for this study. Um, so when we apply the hierarchical agglomerative clustering, we aim to make, um, divide people into different groups so that individuals in the same cluster or the same group have lower dissimilarity in their sequences compared to individuals in different groups. So how do we characterize the dissimilarity in these sequences? We apply an index called order-based sequence dissimilarity. This has been used in previous studies to do multidimensional scaling for process data. Specifically, let's consider two examinees, I and J, who answer the same question. We can calculate some kind of difference or dissimilarity in their action sequences. Here's the formula for this order-based sequence dissimilarity measure. And essentially, it captures people's differences in two aspects. The blue part, F, represents the differences in the ordering of common actions. In other words, for two examinees, if they both have a common action of say choose wrong, we're going to look at what is the difference in the temporal ordering of this particular common action in these two individual sequences. If they are the same, then these doesn't take into the account of the difference. If they're different, then the dissimilarity measure is going to increase. The red part, G, captures the differences in their choice of unique actions. In other words, the number of unique actions to each sequence. For example, uh, example examining, uh, examining one used um, did have the action choose right, and examining two didn't have that. Then their dissimilarity is also going to go up. So for two sequences that are identical, the dissimilarity is going to be equal to zero. If two sequences are more dissimilar in these two aspects, then the dissimilarity index is going to go up and be larger than zero. The data we use contains over 5,000 individuals who completed the 30 minute version of the NAEP grade eight math restricted use partial block items. This includes 5,000 typically developing or TD learners who were sampled from over 20,000 to reduce the computational burden. This also includes 570 learners with learning disability and 70 learners with autism spectrum disorder, denoted ASD. This block of items contained um, 15 items in total. Um, for this study, we restricted our analysis to five multiple choice questions, which includes two questions with a single part and a single correct option. An example is the earlier rotation item eight that we have seen. There are two questions with multiple parts, so ranging from three to two parts, and a single correct option within each of the parts. And there's one additional question with multiple correct responses. Specifically, there are six different options and four out of the six are correct. 
and the examinee is supposed to identify the four correct options. So after applying the clustering method and selecting the optimal number of clusters, we have identified ranging from six clusters to 15 clusters on the five questions. So on this table over here, we have the temporal position of the items. So item one, five, eight, 10, and 12 are the five multiple choice questions. And for each of them, the number of clusters what we have found, which range from six to 15. So let's try to interpret some of the clusters of revision process that we have identified. So here are the results for single part, single select question. This is the result for item one which is CH266695. And we have identified six clusters. Each of these plots over here represents one of the six clusters. And for each of these plots, the x-axis denotes the time points, the time steps. So this is the first action, second, all the way until the 10th. Some individual's action sequences went below, beyond the length of 10, but we censor them at the 10th action. For each of these time steps, um, the bar over here represents the distribution of the actions of individuals in this cluster at this particular time point. For example, we can see that for all of these individuals, the first action was always enter item. This is because people have to first enter the item to do anything else. So here are the things that we have found using the, by looking at the cluster distribution plots. Cluster one and two correspond to individuals who are either firmly correct were firmly incorrect on the question. We can see that these individuals entered the question, selected the correct answer, and then they left the, answer, uh, the question without going back to change their answers. And it's the opposite for this cluster where people selected the incorrect answer and didn't go back. Cluster three are individuals who omitted the question. So they had enter followed by exit, and then they're done. They never went back to submit an answer, as well as people who previewed before making a correct response on a subsequent visit. Cluster four are people who use clear answer, but we can also see that these individuals only selected the correct response on this question. So then they might be using the clear answer button just to explore and to find out about its functionality because this is the very first question and they want to know what this button does. Cluster five are individuals who altered between right and wrong choices. As we can see, there's a blend of correct and incorrect choices in their action sequences. In cluster six, we have people who alter between correct and incorrect choices, and they also use the clear answer button. We can see that for clusters four and six, although both of them use clear answer, the functionality might be a little bit different. People in cluster four might be playing with the button to see what it does. And people in cluster six might be resetting the question because they're not sure and want to start over. Here are the results for item eight, which is another single part, single select question. And we can see that the patterns are very similar. There are a few exceptions. The first is that there is merged a cluster with preview followed by incorrect response. The second is that there's a new cluster where people alternate between different incorrect choices. And that is question five, where you can see people will change during their responses during their visit, but only changing among the different incorrect choices. Lastly, the cluster that corresponds to clear answer with exploration is no longer present. Maybe people figure out what that button does in their first visit, and they're no longer doing that on subsequent visits. Now let's take a brief look at the results for multiple part single select items. And we can see that the clusters and the processes we identified look more complex. The different cluster here reflect different mistake or hesitation on different parts of a question and also the usage of clear answer. I have used different colors to represent different parts of the question. The brighter color of that, uh, brighter tone of that color indicates a correct response and the darker tone represents an incorrect response to that part. Cluster one are the individuals who were correct on all four parts and they didn't go back and change their answers. Cluster two were incorrect, but they didn't change their answers on part three. And different clusters later on, you can see they alternate or were wrong about different parts of the question. For example, in cluster four, people were hesitant about 
part three. So you can see a blend of the dark and the light pink on part three. It was very similar for the other question, which was also um, multi-part single select, where different clusters um, represent different misconceptions about different parts of the question. And lastly, for multiple select items, this is the case where the problem solving process looks the most complex. We identified a total of 15 clusters from this question and different clusters re uh, reflect missing certain correct options, mistakes or hesitation on different options, and also the usage of clear answer. Cluster one are individuals who selected correctly all four correct options out of the six. Question two, uh, cluster two missed one of the correct options. These other clusters also missed some of the correct answers. And for cluster three, they selected one of the incorrect answers. And later on, we have clusters where people might be alternating between different choices and deciding whether I should check this one or uncheck this one. So are there any group differences that we can identify? So do different disability groups differ in the distribution across the clusters? The answer is yes. Across all five items, we performed the chi-score test of independence between disability status and cluster membership. And the null hypothesis of independence was rejected for all five items. And here are the plots for the distribution of percentages across the clusters for each disability group indicated by different colors. We're not going to go into the figures in details, but you can see that there are a lot of differences in disability groups in their composition into the this is the results for item one. Item eight, where we see a lot of differences. And similarly for the other questions, we all see a lot of differences in distribution across the clusters for different disability groups. To summarize what we have found in the differences of cluster distributions, when we compare the typical developing students and the learners with disabilities, we found that for both single part, single select items, Individuals with LD were less likely to be firmly correct, more likely to be firmly incorrect, and more likely to alternate between different incorrect options. Because these two single select items were respectively on fractions and mental rotation, this is consistent with prior research, which indicated that LD students have more difficulties with these concepts and skills. For the multiple part and multiple select questions, we have found that individuals with LD demonstrated incorrect response or hesitation on different parts of the question other than the common misconception by the TD group. Specifically, for example, maybe the most common misconception is about part one for a multiple part question for the TD group. However, for the LD group, they will be more scattered where people are, are wrong or in, unsure about each of these parts, or their most common misconception might be on part three. And also across all items, individuals who are LD were more likely to use clear answer together with response alternation. This might suggest that they are having a more interrupted problem solving process and they're starting over and over again on the question. Comparing TD individuals and those with autism, we have found that for all items, individuals with autism had a comparable if not higher proportion of individuals who responded correctly within one attempt compared to the TD peers. Even on one of the items, we found the ASD group had the highest proportion of correct responders versus individuals in the TD group. This is consistent with prior research that high-functioning autistic learners are strong in abstract spatial reasoning. However, within the same ASD group of individuals, we also find a high proportion of individuals who hesitate or make mistakes on the uncommon misconceptions and a higher proportion of individuals who omitted one of the items. This suggests that there is a greater divide in people's performance in the ASD groups where there are people who perform really well and individuals who lack good performance. So here are a summary of findings from this study. Clustering of revision and review sequences may preserve contextual information that cannot be achieved through the analysis of single actions. For example, the use of clear answer may either indicate platform factionality exploration or hesitation and starting over on a question. We also found that learners within the same disability group can also demonstrate behavioral and performance heterogeneity. 
and clustering before comparing the groups can help us identify different revision patterns and the difference in composition uh, into these different clusters within each disability group. We also found that the most common misconceptions in the PD group are often not the same as that in groups with disability, which suggests that educators might not just uh, target the most common misconception when they educate the students with disabilities. We found also that the use of the clear answer in combination with response alternation was more common among individuals with learning disability. And this might indicate repeatedly starting over on the question and suggest a lack of continuous and uninterrupted engagement in problem solving. This concludes my presentation. And if you have any questions, you can find me at this email address. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, for attending this talk. Today, I'm going to talk about some preliminary findings of a recent IES-funded project. This study team used NAEP process and the performance data to examine the impact of extended time accommodation. Extended time accommodation is the most common testing accommodation. Yet the effects of extended time accommodations are not well understood. Our study uses process data, the series of clicks, entries, and timestamps during student interaction, and the performance data for the digital NAEP assessment. We examine test-taking behavior and the performance differences between eighth grade students with learning disabilities who received extended time accommodation and those who did not receive extended time accommodation. The objective of education assessments should be to accurately reflect learners' knowledge and the capabilities in a content area rather than their disabilities. Federal legislation mandates the inclusion of students with disabilities in the administration of large-scale academic assessment and permit their use of accommodation when learners' disabilities or language skills impact their performance. The goal of test accommodation is to increase reliability, validity, and the fairness of the scores by removing construct irrelevant measurement error. Test accommodations allow students with disabilities to demonstrate their ability and knowledge in an area without interference of their disability and to create equal opportunities for them. The spike in the number of requests for extended time accommodation seen by testing agencies has generated extensive debate over whether test extended time accommodation confers an advantage in assessments or leveling the playing field. However, there is limited evidence of its effect on the scores of students with disabilities. A recent meta-analysis summarized nine studies that examine the effectiveness of extended time accommodation on improving test scores for students with disabilities who were 14 years or older. This meta-analysis found that extended time accommodation is associated with improved test scores for both students with disabilities and their typical developing peers. The effect size of extended time accommodation is 0.9 standard deviations for students with disabilities and 0.66 standard deviation for typical developing students. However, students with disability, learning disabilities with an extended time accommodation still underperform their typical developing peers who did not receive extended time accommodation by 0.41 standard deviations. This meta-analysis showed that it is likely that extended time accommodation can alleviate some barriers to performing well on timed assessment for students with disabilities. However, extended time accommodation cannot completely compensate for their disabilities. In addition to the effect of extended time accommodation on test performance, 
previous studies found extended time accommodation to have social emotional benefits. Both students with and without ADHD reported improved motivation, interest, and comfort, and reduced test anxiety in the extended, extended time accommodation than their peers who took the same exam in standard condition. There are some limitations of the previous studies. First, much of the research to date has limited generalizability due to small and non-representative convenience samples or outcomes on post-secondary entrance exams, for example, SAT. Second, investigators rarely conduct within group comparison of the effect of extended time accommodation. The majority of the studies focused on comparing students with disabilities who received extended accommodation with their typical developing peers who did not receive extended time accommodation. This design confounds the impact of extended time accommodation with potential differences in underlying ability. Third, almost no studies have examined the impact of extended time accommodation on test-taking behaviors. For example, time spent, number of actions on each item, number of visit, and universal design tool use. Given the state of the knowledge base, further investigation is needed to explore the impact of extended time accommodation. Our study tries to answer this following research question. Do students with learning disabilities in the extended time condition spend more time, exhibit a higher number of revisits, perform more actions, and score higher than their peers with learning disabilities who did not receive the extended time accommodation? Our study used restricted NAEP data from the 2017 NAEP Math Assessment. NAEP is the largest national administered low stake test that represents student achievement in the United States. In each participating state, NAEP assesses a representative sample of schools and student performance in reading and mathematics with the intent of represent student population of the whole nation. The restricted data we use include process data, performance data, and student demographic data. The process data include student clicks, entries, and the timestamps during their interaction with the digital NAEP in 2017 mass assessment. The performance data include student item response on each of the 15 test items. The rich data set also have a number of demographic characteristics variables. Taking the advantage of the ability of both action and time features that can be extracted from the NAEP process data, this study is the first to examine test taking behavior differences among students with learning disabilities who received extended time accommodation versus their peers with learning disabilities who did not receive such accommodation. The study sample included students with learning disabilities. There were 600 students with learning disabilities who received extended time accommodation and 930 students with learning disabilities who did not receive such accommodation. The extended time accommodation gave students up to 90 minutes to finish 15 test items. However, the standard test condition gave students up to 30 minutes to finish 15 math items. Students in our study complete one NAEP assessment block of 15 items. These 15 math items include multiple choice, constructed response, or matching items. Our study analyze both person level and item level variables. 
person level variables include disability and the test accommodation. School staff answered a questionnaire for each student with disabilities who were sampled to participate in the NAEP study. This disability questionnaire collected information about the student disability category, whether the student participated in the state assessment with accommodation, and what type of accommodation should be provided. NAEP assessment follows the test accommodation recommendation based on the information collected in this questionnaire. Other person level variables included in this study are demographic characteristics variables, total mass score, and the total response time. Total mass score on the test is the summation of the item level score across all 15 math items. Total response time is the total time in seconds a student spend working on the whole math assessment. Item level variables include item response data. For example, whether the student answered an item correctly, partially correct, or incorrectly. Item response time in our study is defined as the total time in seconds that a student worked on an item, including original visits and all revisits of the item. Item level number of action measures the total number of actions performed on an item during both initial visit and any subsequent revisit. NAEP digital assessment allows students to exit and revisit a test item. The total number of revisit on an item is measured by the number of times an, an examinee visited an item in excluding the revisit that were less than three seconds. We follow the three second rule of Kong 2007 to examine whether the visit is a problem solving behavior or a rapid guessing behavior. Differential item functioning is a well, very well known method to compare the item level test performance of two groups after the two groups are matched on their latent trait. If there is no diff, members from each group at each ability level should have the same probability of answering the item correctly. If a math test item showed diff, students in two groups exhibit different probabilities of succeeding on the item after they are conditioning on their math proficiency. Significant diff is an indication that the items are not likely to measure the intended proficiency or construct, but some secondary or irrelevant construct, jeopardizing test validity and accuracy. Items flagged for diff are often reviewed by substantive experts and test developers. With the availability of item response time data, diff analysis have been expanded to study differential item response time. This study further expanded diff methods to ex examine differential sequence lengths, also called a differential number of actions, and the differential number of visits to test the differences between two groups with and without extended time accommodation on action sequence lengths and number of visits conditioning on their performance on the first five test items. This table shows our sample characteristics. 30 minutes column is the standard test condition. 90 minutes column is the extended time condition. The descriptive analysis table shows that students with learning disabilities in the extended time condition were more likely to be minority or female and score lower on the first five items and all 15 items than students with learning disabilities in the standard testing time condition. 
This table shows the means and the standard deviation of item level response time of the two groups. Each row is one item on the test. 30 minutes column is the standard test time condition. 90 minutes column is the extended time condition. We can see out of the 15 items, five items show the differential response time in column SMD. This figure is based on the number in the previous slide. The response time of students with learning disabilities in the standard test condition on average are on average 86%, 88%, 80%, of their peers with learning disabilities in the extended time accommodation on item one, 12, 13, 14, and 15, respectively. Next, we studied differential sequence length, or called as differential number of actions. This analysis showed that students with learning disabilities in the extended time accommodation condition had a significantly higher number of actions than their peers tested under standard condition on item one, five, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. In other words, for item 1, 5, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, student with LD in the, in the standard condition on average performed 86%, 88%, 90%, 90%, 82%, 78%, or 70% of the number of total actions than their peers with LDs in the extended time condition. On the next slide, we study differential number of visit. This analysis shows that students with learning disabilities in the extended time condition made more visit to six items out of the total of 15 items than their peers tested under standard condition. This figure shows after matching on initial performance Student with learning disability in the extended time condition paid on average 0 0.07, 0 0.06, 0 0.05, 0 0.07, 0 0.17, and 0 0.1, 0 0.13 more visit on each of the items showed on this slide. The last set of analysis is differential item function analysis. One item, item 13, was found to be biased in favor of students with learning disabilities in the extended time accommodation condition. This indicates that students with LD in the extended time accommodation condition received a significant higher average score on item 13 than their peers tested under standard condition, given the same performance on the first five items. Here is what item 13 looks like. It represents two graphs, a circle graph and a bar graph. It asks a student to answer two questions. The first question is a multiple choice item that asks the student to match data to the circle graph. The second question was a constructive response item to ask students to type numbers into eight boxes to match the number show in the bar graph. Although number 13 is the easiest item among items 11 to 15, it is very time consuming. Students with LDs who usually have slower processing speed in reading and math will need extra time to work with this lengthy item. Our results show that 
with extra time, students with LDs in our extended time condition spend more time and had more interactions with this item than their peers who did not receive test accommodation. Therefore, students with disabilities in the extended time condition scored higher than their peers in standard testing condition on this item. Additional descriptive analysis on item 13 show that students with LDs in the extended time accommodation condition were more likely to use universal design tools than their peers with LD in the standard testing condition. For example, compared with students in the standard time condition, students with LDs in the extended time condition had a significantly higher proportion of students use scratch pad to draw, erase, or highlight. They also used the equation editor more than students in the standard testing condition. Compared with students in the standard test, standard time condition, students with LD in the extended time condition use the text-to-speech tool more times than their peers in the standard testing condition. To summarize what we have found in this study, we like to mention that students with LDs in the extended time condition spend more time, visit the test item more times, had a higher number of interaction with test items, and had a higher accuracy rate, particularly among the items toward the end of the test when compared to their learning disability peers who did not receive extended time accommodation. Extended time accommodation alleviates the speediness problem of timed assessment by providing extra time to students with disabilities to interact with the test item, particularly those at the end of the test. They can come back to and test item multiple times to work, they use more universal design tools to facilitate their problem solving and try different strategies to solve the problems. The significant diff on item 13 is an indication that item is not, this item is not likely to measure intended abilities or construct, but instead secondary irrelevant abilities. For example, speediness, which can jeopardize test validity and equality. Receiving extra time might be particularly beneficial for students with learning disabilities to work on medium level difficulty items that are located toward the end of the test. Here is the end of my presentation. If you have questions, please email me. My email address is on the last slide. Thank you so much for attending my talk. Okay, I think we'll get started. Hi, my name is Sarah Brazel, and I'm a program officer at the National Center for Special Education Research. And I monitor these two uh, grants that NICSER has funded to do research using the NAEP process data. Uh, specifically looking at um, testing behavior and outcomes for students with disabilities. And so I really appreciate all of you who are attending today's session. If you have a question, um, you can raise your hand to speak or you can direct your question in the chat to a specific print, uh, presenter by selecting their name or just going ahead and putting it in the general chat to everyone but putting their name at the front so they know your question is for them. Or you can just post a general question. Um, and so we're gonna work through these as time al allows. If we don't have a lot of questions to fill up the time, we do have something to show you on the NAEP website uh, related to the questions explorer tool that we will get to at the end. If not, we'll provide some links and resources for you um, to look at later. Okay, so go ahead and put any information you have in the chat. And already, uh, Berhan has put in um, a link to, um, you can try out the accessibility features and a sample test for this particular um, assessment that they looked at. And so you can go ahead and 
have a chance to um, take a look at that. And then if you have a question you want to raise your hand and ask, please feel free to do that. And I'll, I will call on you. And there should be a raise hand feature. If you're not sure where that is, you can also just unmute your mic and speak. Okay, we have a question in the chat. What were some of the biggest challenges working with the process data? So that's the general question. Anyone who would like to answer that question? Any of our um, speakers today want to address that? Happy to start. Um, okay. you know, uh, hey, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Ruhan. Um, yeah, SRS, I thank you for joining us today. Um, so what I can say about the process data is that, you know, it's, it's a very complex data set because uh, all the actions that's associated with the timestamps uh, has been collected, um, has been locked actually in the assessment system itself. So it is a little bit different from the uh, regular data sets that most of the researchers are used to um, um, analyze. What does it mean? The data usually does not come in a format of columns and the rows. So um, because it is locked um, at the background of a computer system, you can think that it is like the uh, data you see uh, is your uh, internet browser history, you know? And uh, this data, when to, to able to get this data, you need to extract it from this uh, computer system in an XML or, um, um, it, or JSON format, which is a different format again, just to store the data. Um, so um, in, um, just beyond storing it, when you get the data, you see that, for example, for one student, you will get maybe 5,000 ro rows of information. And again, because students use their tablets and you can observe one milliseconds of an action, what this can be, a student see item one and swipe to the next one. And this has been captured as one millisecond. So make extracting meaningful information of, out of this data gets more challenging than just capturing this data and creating the variables. And that's all from me. So please add. Um, Great, thank you. Um, there's also a question for Susu specifically. Um, did you have a chance to see that? Do you want to respond to that one? Yep. Um, is it the question from uh, from Ed? Yes. Yeah. So um, thanks for the question, and that's a great question. For the analysis I perform here, it's um, hierarchical clustering. So in this case, it's hard assignment of people into a particular cluster. So the for the results we got here, we don't have a measure of uncertainty of group assignments. Um, however, I think one possible thing to do, and maybe it's a wise thing to do, is to replicate the clustering for multiple times and see how the clustering of a particular observation differs across the different replications. And that might be a way to see how much uncertainty and instability there is in the cluster assignment. Thank you. Um, Rahan, I don't know if you're able to show a question with the equation editor or get that set up while we answer another question, see if there's another question, but then- um, Sure, let me get that, yeah. Let's see, Andrew, I don't know if you can listen, but are, are we able to share screens? Do we have the permission to do that? Let me message him real quick. Andrew said yes. Okay, great. And Rahan, do you see that option on your screen? Yes, let me um, get the webs. Okay. Uh, so while, he, while he's doing that, ahead. let's see if we have, um, okay, let's see. Also, this is, is there... Bob. If oh, there's, yes, Bob, if there isn't ahead. another question, I have Thank another you. question. Awesome. Yeah, I'm just concerned in general with how much familiarity the students had with the tools and interfaces. Uh, did they have a chance to practice with this first? Were these tools and interfaces similar to what they were used to using in the classroom or during practice? Uh, That's I mean, a great question. Also, whoever responds, can you talk about the data that you received if you had any data on the practice sessions? 
Whoever wants uh, to my, respond. I guess I can start with that. So I, I as I was trying to uh, describe in my presentation, the, the, the uh, it, at each NAEP session, students have uh, some time to play around with the with the online uh, platform and try all the, uh, uh, the accommodations or accessibility features available to them. So, but you know that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody will have the same. Oh, they they will try, or or everyone has the same footing. So, um, it's possible that you know familiarity with the uh, with these items might be related to their performance at the end. But they have a chance to look at these uh, items before before they do the actual assessment. Maybe I can yeah. add a little bit more. Yes, great. Yes. Oh, yes, um, just to be more specific at the beginning of the, you know, before the cognitive assessment, as Burhan mentioned, there's a tutorial provided. And in the tutorial, um, it has been shown to the students how to use individual or specific um, buttons or features on this assessment system. In addition to that, there is also interactive parts during the tutorials. For example, uh, from the SUSE's presentation, I will use the clear answer button, right? Because if, if Nate is aware that this may not be available, you know, to some students from their state assessments, let's say. So during the tutorial, clear, it is, has been explained what is the clear uh, answer button or function is. Plus there's an item following that, that students practice with this feature. And uh, there is a limited time, just to be specific, during the tutorial. So students cannot spend 40 minutes, you know, during the tutorial. Uh, there are some automated sections after uh, some time. This, um, you know, uh, the next uh, activity just starts. I hope that it's, um, it, it addresses your question, Bob. And Bob, were you also interested in things like calculator use? So one thing we were interested in is data on, did they, did they use calculator at school or like on their state assessment, those kinds of things? Is that also what you're interested in? Yeah, it's actually a big question I have as well. Um, are students aware of, you know, if they're not used to having access to calculator for certain types of problems, um, even if it's theoretically available for them, they might not think to use it. And do any of you remember in the student questionnaire data, is there yeah. anything related? Uh, I was going to say maybe they do have data, but uh, I was looking at Rohan to see if, if she remembers if they are collecting that data in NAEP, whether or not for students example, have any alert. Uh, for the student questionnaire, actually, there are questions not for all features that has been, you know, embedded in the system because there's not enough time. Also, demographic information has been collected uh, during the, you know, uh, these uh, questionnaires at the end of the assessment. But there are questions for specific uh, features. For example, calculator. Do you use calculator at school in your mathematics uh, classes? Um, so this type of questions are available and also the surveys are available online. So you can go and check. This is just one example that it's, it's at top of my head, but not for example, equation editor. And it is mainly because to optimize the time and the efficiency of the uh, survey and the assessment itself. But what I can say that, you know, there's ongoing explorations uh, by NAEP to understand students use of the features in the tutorial and connecting it to the cognitive session to see if there's any discrepancies. And also um, accommodations of panel or the, um, the technical group working in NAEP, uh, you know, to my knowledge, so I don't wanna speak, <laughs> you know, of OES, but um, to my knowledge, these technical groups are working really hard to, um, to understand the need of the students and to provide enough features just one note on the tutorial um, that has been available and so supposed to be um, the link for it. It has been changing a little bit across the years because NAEP switched to operational at the digital assessments in 2017. And you know, if there is something that has been approved, the tutorials also has been developed in the meantime. Thanks for clarifying. Oh, sure. Any other questions? People can feel free to unmute their mic. Let's see, looks like we have one here. 
wondering what extent the panelists think that this body of research carries implications for test design, accommodation design and delivery or instructional supports to address learning needs prior to the testing experience? Maybe I can start again. Uh, so that they, if anyone wants to uh, add something that they can add later. Um, I, I, I can only speak to the one the presentation that I, I gave, which in which uh, we were looking at the uh, uh, to see if any of the um, you know accommodations are are uh, behaving the way that we expect them to behave. Like we expect these accommodations and accessible features to uh, benefit students if they are using and act as uh, do not as like a distractor. And in some cases, um, at, at least the uh, initial evidence showed that some of these um, some of these accessibility features are might be in fact inhibit like uh, just uh, distracting students from from the task at hand. So, uh, what that means in that in, in the future that means that you know uh, test developers or assessment developers when they are developing these assessments and tests, maybe they need to be more aware of these things and that. Uh, you know, in, in, while we are thinking, or while they think that this will affect uh, benefit students, and and, uh, and we will get a better construct validity at the end, it's possible that maybe we are we are not getting the full picture, and we are not getting the students' actual uh, uh, performance in the test. So that that's one thing that I think you know, these results might be benefiting the uh, test developers and and also the assessment developers. And Sin, I think your presentation talked a little bit about you know the extended time and also that one particular item. I don't know if you want to address it with with this question. Yeah, sure. So uh, my presentation looked at a uh, um, uh, differences in test taking behavior be between students with LD in the extended time condition versus their peers with LD in the standard um, testing time accommodation. Uh, generally speaking, students receive extra time is, ben is beneficial, especially for those items that's very lengthy at the end. Um, most of the students are running out of time at the end. They uh, get tired, frustrated, and um, uh, they tend to skip those lengthy items if they know of oh, the time, the clock is ticking, I only have 30 seconds less, left. But however, for those who have up to 90 minutes to work on, the, uh, the 15 test items, they um, <clears throat> they have extra time to work on those complicated lengthy items. Um, the results of the, this study we can see for, for especially for that item 13, the, it's not so difficult compared to the rest of the four items at the end. They just take a lot of time, take, need a student to be patient, read through the item, and then go do step for step by step to answer the questions. You don't look in comparison with some of other items at the very end, those items are quite difficult. Even if you put down time, you, you calm yourself down, you have extra time to work on a um, student with low ability may not get there. And another uh, suggestion from the results is how much extra time we need to give to students in this kind of large scale assessment. From the data we look at, um, among the students who received extended time accommodation, they were giving up to 90 minutes, but not all of them use up to 90 minutes. 72% of them use uh, finish the test within 30 minutes. That's the standard time. 25% finish the test uh, between 30 to 60 minutes. The remaining 3% actually finish the test between 90, uh, 60 to 90 minutes. With the average sorry, to test sorry to interrupt you, but they're about to cut us out. So just so you guys oh, remember to, to rate the session and please reach out to the um, speakers if you have any questions that we didn't get addressed. I'm sure they would be glad to answer the questions by email. Thank you guys so much for coming today. And I really thank all the presenters for preparing really great presentations for us to give us some wonderful things to think about.